Start roll. Hi everybody, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. It's uh, 7 o'clock, so we want to get started. The folks at Riverbender.com have been kind enough to live stream this on the internet. So uh, I know our campaign has used the social networking sites to get it out there. We've probably got some people watching it online. So uh, we don't want them to see a blank stage and wonder what's going on. We want to get this thing started off. I'm Jason Plummer. I, I really do appreciate everybody coming out. I, I tell people all the time, you know, it's great to see people come out to events. Um, Everybody's got their own life. They're at church, they're at work, they're at little league practice, they're at baseball games, they're, they're doing things with their family. But uh, this election cycle is very, very important. I believe it's the most important election we've seen in a while. And uh, so the fact that you guys take time away from your personal life to be here uh, means a lot to me and, uh, and everybody involved in the process. So I appreciate y'all doing that. Uh, I would take a couple minutes to talk about myself, uh, talk about the campaign, talk about the district. Uh, obviously, the cycle they've redrawn the congressional district, so it's a little bit different, a little bit new. And then we just want to mainly uh, open this thing up to you guys because uh, you know I'm not here to talk to you. I'm here to listen to you and answer your questions and, and take your comments and feedback. Uh, like I said, my name is Jason Plummer. I live in O'Fallon, running for the 12th congressional district. 12th congressional district. Right now, we are standing like the northern edge of the 12th congressional district. It goes from Alton to Kentucky. It's made up of 12 counties in southwestern Illinois. It's a very unique district. It's uh, economically very diverse. Uh, culturally, it's, it's pretty conservative. Demographically, it's very diverse. It's a very unique district. You're up here kind of in suburban St. Louis. There's a large manufacturing base. There's a transportation base. You've got Scott Air Force Base in St. Clair County. Once you get south of St. Clair County, it becomes very rural. You run into a lot of uh, the energy sector, the coal, the oil, the gas, the agricultural industry that is very, very key to, to uh, Southern Illinois and to the state as a whole. I'm running for this office because I think if you look at the 12th Congressional District, uh, you look at those resources we just talked about, SIU Carbondale, Scott Air Force Base, you look at the agricultural resources, you look at the coal we have on the ground, you look at our access to transportation networks, road, rail, river, air infrastructure, you look at the hardworking people we have in the 12th, we've got a lot of wonderful things going for us. We're, unfortunately, we're struggling. We're struggling economically. We've got high unemployment. We see a lot of people moving out of the 12th Congressional District. We see a lot of people moving out of Illinois. So the question is, if we have all these wonderful natural resources, if we have all this human talent, if we have all these things going for us, but we're still struggling, why is it? And I tell you, it's because of poor public policy. I think it's because of poor public policy in Washington. I think it's because of poor public policy, policy in Springfield, Illinois. I'm running for office to change that. I think I have a background that can do that. I'm a businessman. I'm a Navy reservist. My unit's actually based at Scott Air Force Base, so I know that institution very well. I think we've got a real opportunity. And I tell people all the time, this isn't about running for Congress. This isn't about electing one congressman. I truly think that if we run the campaign, we can run. If we run the campaign, we will run. If we work as hard as we're going to work, and we are working, I think we can change the dynamics of the 12th Congressional District. I run into people all the time in Southern Illinois. All the time in Southern Illinois. And they say, well, you know, I'm a conservative Democrat. You know, but I feel like my party's left me. They say, I'm a conservative Democrat, but I don't agree with the president. I don't agree with Nancy Pelosi. I don't agree with Mike Madigan. I don't agree with Pat Quinn. And I say, well, welcome to the Republican Party. If you look, if you look at, if you look at this district, and you look at all the things we have going for us, like it's a culturally conservative district. You know, I tell people all the time, I'm not bashful about it. I'm pro-life. I'm for the Second Amendment. I want to get government out of the way. I don't want government. I don't want the government involved in our health care decisions, but I don't want the government involved in, in, the, in, in the economy to, to a huge degree either. I think that if we let the American people do what they do best, if we let our coal miners mine coal, if we let our truck drivers drive trucks, if we let our farmers farm and not worry about how much dust their combine's picking up, if we let the American people do what they do best, the 12th Congressional District of the State of Illinois and our nation as a whole is going to thrive. Unfortunately, I think government's getting in the way of that. Uh, people all the time say, well, what's the number one reason why you're running for office? And a lot of candidates will say, well, I run for office 
because I want to repeal Obamacare. I'm running for office because you know, I want to support uh, the Second Amendment or because I'm pro-life. And, and I agree with all those things. Those are all very important things. But when people ask me that, I tell them it's very simple. I'm running for office because I want to shrink the size and scope of the federal government. I think that if we do shrink the size and scope of the federal government, you lower taxes. You don't have to worry about government getting in the way of, of your Second Amendment rights. You don't have to worry about government getting in the way of any of your constitutional rights. You don't have to worry about uh, outrageous spending. Taxes will be cut. We will get government out of the way so our private sector can thrive, so American families can make decisions based on their well-being, and not on the well-being of bureaucrats in Washington. So my campaign is, is working very hard. We're, we're kind of in a unique situation right now, and that uh, I go everywhere and people say, okay, well, enough about you, tell me about your opponent. And I say, well, I don't really have one right now. <laughs> so, so we're working on that, and, and don't, don't, don't be fooled. We're going to have an opponent. Uh, Nancy Pelosi thinks she's going to be Speaker of the House again. And she thinks she's going to be Speaker of the House, and she thinks she's going to build that majority through the state of Illinois. In 2010, the voters of the state of Illinois elected five new Republican congressmen. Five, on top of the ones we have already, they elected five new Republican congressmen. And so what did we do here in Illinois? Well, we redrew the lines to go against the will of the voters. And the Democrats said they think they're going to flip our delegation to a 12 to 6 Democrat to Republican delegation. I personally think they've drawn the lines a little too thin. I think they've stretched themselves out. And I think that we're going to make sure that we throw a huge roadblock in the way of Nancy Pelosi becoming speaker here in the state of Illinois. The number one district making sure that roadblock is erected is Illinois 12. If you look at what's going on right now, some of you may follow politics, some of you may not follow politics, but there's prognosticators in Washington. There's the Cook Political Report, there's Rothenberg, and there's uh, the Liberal Daily Coast Group, and there's just a lot of these organizations Every single organization has moved this district from lean Democrat to toss-up. And some of them have moved it from lean Democrat to toss-up to till Republican. Because we're running an aggressive campaign, because we've recruited a lot of volunteers, because we're working hard, because we're crisscrossing the district. Most importantly though, because the voters are fed up and we represent and articulate the message they believe in. So, I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody being here, and uh, I would like to open it up to questions. Like I said, uh, I'm not here to preach to you all. I'm here to listen to you all, and I, I really do hope that everyone uh, takes the time to ask some questions, listen to uh, to what I have to say. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, you know, uh, give me some consideration, and uh, let's definitely make sure that when you leave the door, you go out the door. I don't care who you're voting for, but you're going out to the door, and you're talking to people at church, you're talking to people at work, you're talking to people at Lola Games, you're talking to people wherever you may spend time about how important it is that they get out and vote. Because this election is extremely important, from the presidential level to the county board level. It's an extremely important election. There's a lot of important candidates on the ballot, county level, state level, federal level, and I really need, we need, as a country, we need an informed, energetic, active electorate getting out there and driving people to the polls. So I appreciate you being here, and I'd like to uh, just open it up for questions. spending and borrowing, um, you know, Obamacare isn't bad enough, but I think the, the biggest thing is uh, the EPA that's just crept in that a lot of people don't know about. Can you speak a little bit about the, the effects that the EPA's new regulations and overreaches have had on this district in particular? Yeah, and I appreciate the question because that is very important, and I'm going to go at that from a couple angles. Um, first, I just want to point something out because I think a lot of times, you know, we hear billions of dollars and trillions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of jobs and millions of jobs. We hear all these stats and figures, and sometimes you just need to get rid of all that stuff and you need to look at things from a common sense uh, standpoint. Uh, first off, the EPA has over 18,000 workers. And my question to you is, uh, is that necessary? What happens when the EPA has 18,000 uh, employees? What happens when these bureaucracies grow so large? Well, I'll tell you, and I'm not bashing people that work for the EPA, but I'm telling you, there's 18,000 people out there that feel a need to justify their existence. They have to justify why they're employed by the federal government. So how do they go about doing that? Well, they go about doing that by creating regulations that I personally believe strengthen our economy. Let's talk about a couple regulations. The EPA 
actually, and right now this is kind of stopped, but they're kind of trying to push it through committee and through a couple different angles outside of legislative bodies. Um, they're trying to regulate how much dust a combine or tractor or just farmers working their fields kick up. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, I think outside of God, there's not many people that can regulate dust. Uh, you know, I mean, dust is, it's, it's a natural thing. It happens if you're going to be farming fields, if you're going to be producing crop, if you're going to be feeding people, you're going to have dust. Even more worrisome than that, they actually tried to pass a rule that uh, kids 16 and younger could work on their own family farms. I, I think the backbone of this nation is small businesses, and I think the backbone of our small business industry is, is farms, family farms. And I, I mean, I grew up with kids who are, who are 8 or 9 or 10 working on a family farm, bucking hay, driving tractors, helping their family out. And the fact that these bureaucrats in Washington, who've never spent time on a farm in Iowa or Southern Illinois or Indiana or anywhere, want to regulate that it is absolutely ridiculous to me. And I will never forget, there was actually an interview, and they were talking to uh, some EPA employees, and they said, now how can you justify, how do you in Washington, D.C., Congressman Rasky, how do you in Washington, D.C. know about family farms and how they operate, whether or not kids should be working on family farms? And the, uh, the EPA employee said, well, you know, the, uh, the secretary, the cabinet member, the secretary went to the Iowa State Fair this year. <laughs> and, and this is true. And they said, well, okay, but you know, I mean, what does that have to do with, with regulating family farms? I said, well, they spend a lot of time at the Iowa State Fair and talk to a lot of farmers. I mean, these people, they don't come from middle America. They don't come from family farms. And here they are telling us what we have to do. Uh, the EPA has strangled our economy. The 12th Congressional District has a tremendous amount of coal. We've gone from 37 operating coal mines to 9 operating coal mines in 20 years. Now, I assure you, we haven't run out of coal. If you take John Chimkis' district, which is just to the east of our district, and you take our district, there's more BTUs in coal than Saudi Arabia has in oil. In Southern Illinois. More BTUs in coal than Saudi Arabia has in oil. But because of the EPA, because of other bureaucrats, because of crazy red tape we throw up in front of our industry, we're not allowed to access those products. We're not allowed to employ people with quality jobs. I mean, coal miners in Southern Illinois, that's a great job. That pays well. That's the lifeblood of so many of these small towns. Why is DuCoin shrinking? Why is, why, why, why is Steelville shrinking? Why is Pinckneyville shrinking? Why is Murfreesboro shrinking? Well, because we're taking away their industry. We're taking away their jobs. The EPA is a major fault of that. And like John Shemkis has done, like Mark Kirk has done, like other congressmen from Midwestern states have done, Republican congressmen, I'll do everything I possibly can to stand up to the EPA and make sure they stay off the backs of farmers, coal miners, and other small businessmen in the 12th Congressional District. I think there's a question over here. Hi, uh, So I'm, you know, as far as I can tell, the, the Democratic Party they don't have a, a budget. They don't they don't have a plan. They're just going to let Medicare go broke. Uh, but Paul Ryan, he does have a budget. It's been getting a lot of support recently. And I was I was wondering what your thoughts on Paul Ryan's budget were, and if you were elected to Congress, would you support it? Yeah. You bring up a great point, and it's again the same thing. You know what's going on in Washington D.C. You know the, the president of the United States doesn't have a budget. Uh, what he's presented to the House and to the Senate, uh, Democrat-controlled Senate, that matter, at zero votes. Now, what kind of leadership are you providing when Barbara Boxer won't even vote for your budget? What does that say about your budget? What does that say about your priorities? What kind of political example are you making? And are we truly sitting back saying, you know what? The American people are struggling right now. There's families that, that, that are sitting at the table trying to figure out how to balance their budget. There's small businessmen trying to figure out how to keep people employed. They're finding onerous regulations, crazy taxes, and all this, this crazy stuff out here. And we're not even going to throw out a reasonable budget that Barbara Boxer will vote for? It's ridiculous. The Senate, Democrat-controlled Senate. I think it's been over a thousand days since they offered a budget. I, I've lost track now, but I, I know it's, it's over a thousand days now since they've offered a budget. Then you take the House, controlled by the Republicans right now, but mind you, for two years, uh, President Obama had the Senate, he of course had the presidency, the Senate, and the House. They did nothing. They can talk all they want about Paul Ryan. They can talk all they want about his budget. They can talk all they want about the Republicans. They controlled everything for two years, and they did nothing to solve the long-term problem. So Paul Ryan comes out, presents a budget. A lot of people think that the budget provides uh, uh, a path to solving the fiscal problems we have right now. And what's going to happen because of that budget? Well, I can tell you what's going to happen because of that budget. In about three months, four months, 
you're going to see these TV commercials, and they're going to have you know grandma in a wheelchair getting dumped over the cliff by every Republican congressman in the United States and every candidate for Congress in the United States because they're going to try to scare people. Because as this gentleman said, the president hasn't presented a legitimate budget. The Senate hasn't presented a budget. They have no plan. They have no alternative. The Republicans throw something out there that economists from both parties have said solves a lot of our problems. And instead of saying, you know, instead of uh, negotiating on that plan or instead of presenting their own alternative plan, they're going to attack the Republicans for trying to solve problems. That's what's wrong with politics today. I saw a new poll today. Congress has an approval rating of 17%. You know why Congress has an approval rating of 17%? Because all you're going to see on TV is Jason Plummer dumping grandma over a cliff, and all you're going to see is, is uh, you know, Jason Plummer trying to you know, end all of these different programs. But the Democrats themselves are asleep at the switch, providing no solutions, and allowing, allowing these things to run rampant. So I think we need people like that uh, presenting alternative <coughs> plans. I've met with them. I think that they do provide a lot of long-term um, stability to our fiscal situation, and we have to have more people like that. So I look forward to going to Washington and working with these guys and making sure we solve these problems. Because at the end of the day, Social Security, Medicare, a lot of these other programs that people, I see quite a few people in the audience right now, uh, they're, they're on Social Security or they're quickly approaching Social Security, and they expect it to be there. And if we don't get serious, as I always say all the time, have serious people provide serious solutions for the serious problems we face, Social Security won't be there. And so I am going out there to make sure that we provide some sustainability and some prosperity to those programs. Next question. We've got a couple right here. Hi, Jason. Tonight I heard a news feed that indicated that the middle class in America is dwindling so quickly because most people have their entire life savings invested in their homes, and of course, the home values now are, I don't know that we're really seeing it so much here as they are on the coast, but, you know, what, we need to think of a cure for this. They're saying that the uh, recovery, which they were estimating at first to be a decade, now will be at least two decades to recover that. Do you have any ideas on the solution? Well, I think there's, a lot of things that go into the solution. I just read a report, probably the same thing you read a day or two ago, said that uh, the middle class in America over the last three years, three years coincides perfectly with somebody coming into office, but the middle class over the last years has lost 40% of their net worth. On average, the American middle class, 40% of their net worth, they're back to where they were in 1992. Now think about that for a second. We've basically gone backwards two decades in three years. It's a very scary thought. That's a lot of ground to make up. You're not going to make that ground up overnight, but you are going to eventually make ground up if you put the right policies in, in perspective. And I tell people all the time, you know, if you're a congressman running for office in um, Nebraska or North Dakota or Oklahoma or somewhere like that, you're fighting some national trends. You're fighting a recession. You're fighting a lot of problems that are going on at the national level. Here in Illinois, we've got a double whammy. We've got a double whammy because Springfield's messed up. We're fighting what's coming out of Springfield, and we're fighting what comes out of Washington, D.C. So, uh, you know, and then people say, well, why are people moving to Wisconsin? Why are people moving to Missouri and Iowa and Indiana and Kentucky? Well, because we live in a really rough place economically right now. We can provide these solutions. The first way we do is we extend the tax cuts. And you're going to hear people say, well, these are the Bush tax cuts. And I, I kind of chuckle when they call it the Bush tax cuts, because the last president that actually extended the tax cuts was President Obama. And if anyone looks into these tax cuts, they'll see the vast majority of the savings went to the middle class. There weren't tax cuts for the rich, there were tax cuts for everybody. And I think that what those tax cuts proved, the fact that President Bush did them, and we saw economic growth, the fact that President Obama did it to uh, lessen the impact of the recession, shows that they knew that was gonna be a benefit to the economy. They were gonna, you know, the Democrats don't like giving money back to the people, even though it's the people's money. But they knew they had to do it. Now they think that we're coming out of this account, this recession. I'll be frank with you. I don't think we are. I see the job numbers that come out. Let me tell you, that's funny math they're using. We have to add 150,000 jobs a month just to keep up with population growth. Last month we had 69,000. The month before that, the numbers came out okay at first, but then when they uh, redid them the following month, it, I think it was 83,000. So in two months, we had job growth 
uh, that is essentially what we need for one month just to keep up with population trends. Uh, we have a lot of people out of work. We've got people leaving the workforce. The way that we bring uh, fiscal uh, prosperity back to American people, in my own humble opinion, what I'll fight for in Washington, D.C., is we completely reform the tax code. It's not about tax cuts or tax increases. It's about reforming the tax code. We have a regressive tax code. We have a regressive tax code that negatively impacts investment, and negatively impacts working, and negatively in impacts savings. I tell people all the time, especially my Democrat friends, you know, sometimes, like I said, I have to go back to common sense. And uh, I say, you know, you're for taxes on cigarettes and tobacco products. Because why? Well, because you think that a tax, a higher tax on cigarettes and tobacco products will keep kids from smoking. And a higher tax on other sin issues will keep people from drinking or smoking or doing whatever it is that they want to do. So, so what's higher taxes on, on wages do? What is higher taxes on investment do? What does higher capital gains taxes do? Well, I'd argue, if it keeps people from smoking, it's probably going to keep people from working, it's probably going to keep people from investing, it's probably going to keep people from putting their money back into the economy. So what we have to do is... So what we have to do is we've got to make it... We have to provide incentives for people to invest, we've got to provide incentives for people to work, we've got to make it... You know, I know people all over the 12th Congressional District right now, uh, in Continental Tire, in Mount Vernon right now, they're trying to fill 440 positions. They can't fill 440 positions right now because people are making more money not working than they would be working. Yeah. Now, what kind, of, what kind of society is that? You know, we've got uh, certain demographics have an uh, unemployment rate over 33%. You know, high school kids can't find jobs right now. Returning vets cannot find jobs right now. College graduates cannot find jobs right now. I don't know about you all, but I bet you everybody here had a job when they were a teenager. And I bet you that job was one of your first jobs. I bet you that job taught you to show up on time. I bet you taught you to work. I bet you taught you a hierarchy and it taught you how to you know, work with customers and how to work with the boss and how to be responsible for things. And you went from that job to the next job to the next job to the next job. And you built yourself a nice career. Well, if kids can't find jobs right now, and kids can't find jobs when they graduate college, at what point are they going to enter the workforce? And how much time have they missed learning those basic fundamentals that they're going to need to be successful in life, to put food on the table, and provide for their families? Right now, we have a government in Washington, D.C., not the entire government, but a lot of our elected officials right now would much rather see uh, higher taxes, more people dependent on government, because they're a little bit more enlightened, and they know how to direct our lives. And I would argue I'd much rather have people out there working, providing for their families, learning how to you know, provide for themselves, and, and that's how we're going to get it back. I guarantee you, that 40% drop in net worth, we're not going to make that up on food stamps. We're not going to make that up getting a check from Springfield or a check from Washington. We're going to make that up by going to work, by investing in companies, by building companies, by employing people, by broadening our economy. That's how we're going to make up that, that, that huge uh, decrease we've seen in the last three years. Next question, sir. I guess my uh, problem is, uh, since the House controls the spending, why can't they stop these federal agencies from continuing to grow and spending more money than uh, they could? Because there's no budget, so there's no allocation of funds. So somebody ought to be, you know, it seems to me like the House ought to say, look, we're going to cut, we're going to cut your amount of money, now what are you going to do? Well, and I think we've started to see that. Um, you know, we, we sent 86 new Republican congressmen to Washington, D.C. Uh, in 2010, after 2010. And I, I think immediately we saw the conversation change from how much we're going to spend to how much we're going to cut. Um, and, and you're right, spending does originate in the House. And I, I've seen Republicans, I mean, right now we're withholding funding from a lot of the provisions from, from Obamacare, government run health care. And by, by delaying the, the spending on those provisions, we're hoping that those, those, those bureaucracies and those, uh, you know, the little things throughout government that Obamacare creates, aren't going into effect. And hopefully, before those things go into effect, before we're forced to fund those things, the Supreme Court will rule what I believe is the case, and that's Obamacare is unconstitutional. If they do not rule that Obamacare is unconstitutional, uh, that's why it is so important to elect me to this position and elect other Republicans to maintain our majority, because we can still starve a lot of the funds necessary to make sure uh, government doesn't take care of the health care of our lives. So, health care is just one example, but there's there's numerous examples throughout government where the Republicans, could you imagine if we didn't control the House right now? Could you imagine what would be going on? 
I, I have to give a lot of credit to the Republican leadership because they take a beating all the time. We only control a third of government. You know, we don't have the um, we don't have we actually we control like one sixth of government. We don't have the executive branch. I'm not sure who controls the judiciary, and we only have half the legislative branch. You know, so I mean, we, we really have one sixth of government right now, and I have to give a lot of credit to the Republicans that are kind of the tip of the spear in Washington right now. That's why it's so important we defeat this president. That's why it's so important we defeat people like Claire McCaskill next door. We get Republicans elected in the Senate. And that's why it's so important we go on the very next Uh, next question, sir. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be able to ask you guys some questions. Um, this is, kind of goes on this gentleman's question a little bit. We've seen a lot of people, especially in the last election, get elected. They, they ran as super conservatives, and then they get up there. Something happens to them, and next thing you know, they're voting down around 60 percent uh, at the time with the Republicans, 40 percent with the Democrats. Could you talk a little bit about what might happen up there to cause that and what you can do to stick to the, your guns? Sure. No, I, I appreciate it. Um, a couple questions there. First, you know, I'm not going to be voting with the Democrats 40% of the time. I can assure you that. Um, and, uh, I think the problems we see, and I'll say the problems we see in Springfield and the problems we see in Washington for that matter, I don't think they're because of one party. You know, I know up here we're, we're saying Democrats, Democrats, Democrats. And I think that they've been a huge problem, especially, you know, the last three years. But it's not like the Republicans were perfect when, when they controlled everything either. And I think it's important that we send people to Washington that have that perspective. Just because it's got an R next to its name or just because it's got an R next to a piece of legislation doesn't mean it's a perfect piece of legislation. You know, and so I think it's important that we keep that perspective. I think it's important that we send people to Washington that are fairly independent. You know, we said we have a lot of people in Washington D.C. right now that you know they get out there. Well, let me. Our biggest problem, I personally, is the way we redraw our districts. Look what they've done in Illinois. Okay, so you got a bunch of districts that are very, very Republican. You got a bunch of districts that are very, very, very Democrat. You got a few districts, like only twelve, that's right in the middle. So you're going to have people that go out to Washington from Illinois 12 with common sense. It's not beholden to you know, what the very, very liberal people in very, very liberal districts say. Very, very Republican people in very Republican districts say. You have to send people to Washington with common sense that realize that uh, everything that's Republican is not perfect, and definitely everything that's Democrat is not perfect. We've got to send people out to Washington, D.C. that, quite frankly, aren't dependent on being in Washington, D.C. I enjoy business. I enjoy the Navy. I look forward to doing those things for a long time. I don't want to go to Washington D.C. for a career. I'd love to see term limits in Washington D.C. You know, I think that you know, yeah, I think our biggest problem we have, which you're hitting at, is there's a lot of people that get out to Washington D.C. They come from these very safe districts, and they fall in love with being in Washington D.C. They fall in love with what I call the cocktail circuit. They fall in love with being called congressman or senator or whatever, and they just do everything they possibly can to stay in Washington D.C. Well, I'm, I'm not desperate to stay in Washington, D.C. I'm desperate to turn on, turn on the economy in LA 12. I'm desperate to get people jobs in Pinkyville and in Alton and in you know, Mound City and Pulaski County because that's what we need. And I'll do whatever I can. But you know, I go to Washington, D.C. with the perspective of a conservative. And uh, I, uh, I can't see anything in Washington, D.C. that would corrupt my view of what's important in Washington, you know, what's important to our country. What's important to our economy is a strong economy. How do we have a strong economy? Low taxes, less government interaction. How do we have a strong nation, a strong constitution? I understand the constitution. I know what it means, what it says, and what it doesn't say, unlike our president, who is a constitutional law professor. You know, it's, it's, it's frightening that you know, he was indoctrinating students in this process. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I understand what we need to do. I come from a conserv conservative perspective. When I was at the Heritage Foundation in 2005, our biggest problem was with the Democrats. Our biggest problem was the Republicans that were in control. You remember they always talk about the permanent majority? Remember the permanent majority? Bush was, President Bush was, was president, and we controlled the Senate, we controlled the House. Republicans had a permanent majority, we were never going to lose it. But what happened? We lost it like that. And why did we lose it like that? Because instead of trying to maintain our permanent majority by doing the right things and earning it, we started trying to uh, maintain it through massive earmarks and through 
um, you know, doing whatever we had to do, whatever people in Washington said was the right thing. That's not why we get sent to Washington. We get sent to Washington by the voters in our district, and you have to respond to them. Good-looking T-shirt there. <laughs> My wife made that. <laughs> um, talking about the uh, teenagers with their jobs. I, my first job was 15 years old, pumping gas at 13.4 cents a gallon. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I was able to make change for the customer. So, uh, so many kids can't do that today. And education is a problem, our education system. Um, perhaps you might have some thoughts about that, as well as the retirement system for the uh, public sector. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what to address there. I don't know whether to address the fact you're allowed to work at 15, the fact that gas was 13.4 cents a gallon, or, or the questions you actually asked. Because I personally think those are all issues. I, I think that those are all major issues. Uh, I think getting to the point what you said, you know, let's look at it from a state perspective first. I mean, you know, I think the the, the, the official sport of the state of Illinois is kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at what they've done to the pensions here in Illinois, I mean, talk about a lack of backbone. You know, I will, I will not forget, I'll just be frank, I won't forget, I was right in this area right here. Four or five years ago, I was sitting at a legislative thing where um, it was just like this. Only I was in the crowd asking state legislators questions. And I asked one state legislator a question about, uh, actually, I did, another gentleman asked the state legislator a question about, uh, you know, the deficits we had, the pension problems we had, and, you know, are we really going to finally resolve this? You know, Governor Blagojevich is in charge. Are we going to solve this? And the legislator said, well, you know, the way I see it is by the time those things kind of become big issues, I'm not going to be in office anymore. Oh, no. And it was like, you know, it was like, poof, right there. It was like, that's what's wrong with Springfield. You don't have people willing to grab the bull by the horns. If you're a small businessman and you're bleeding money and your bottom line is bright red, you've got to do something about it. But these people in Washington, these people in Springfield, they borrow more. In Washington, they just print more. And they think that eventually something's going to come along and solve these problems. Uh, we have to grab the bull by the horn. Here in Illinois, I can't really address that, uh, but I can work with state legislators to, to you know, try to help instill my values, try to get good people elected. Like I said, the 12th Congressional District, it's not just about electing a Republican congressman. If we run the type of campaign we're supposed to run, if we work as hard as we're supposed to run, good Republican state legislators will win as well. And they will help reinforce what's going on, and help change what's going on in Springfield. Um, the state of Illinois, and, and I feel sorry for a lot of, you know, a lot of these public employees, let's be frank, I mean, these people may have worked for 30 years, and they, you know, not everybody, but they may have put a lot of money in the system, and these people have spent the money like crazy. It doesn't go into a lockbox. That pension money doesn't go sit over here and get invested in bonds that, you know, well, it used to be 3%, but now, you know, <laughs> half a percent, or, you know, I mean, they, that money doesn't stay there. That money just gets spent, and people assume that, you know, it's pay go. You know, pay as you go. That the money will eventually be there. Right now, the money's not there. The state of Illinois has four of the ten worst public pensions in the country. We've got pensions that are less than 30% funded. Southern Illinois is getting abused. Let's talk about teachers. You know, there's two different pension systems for teachers in the state of Illinois. There's a pension system for Southern Illinois teachers. There's a pension system for teachers in Chicago. Can you guess which one's better funded? Yeah. Exactly. You know, well, in Washington, D.C., it's the same thing. You have a bunch of career politicians that aren't used to running a business. They're not used to signing the front end of a paycheck. They're not addressing the issues like this gentleman brought up of Social Security, of Medicare. The fact of the matter is, Social Security is going broke right now. And Republicans say, hey, let's fix it. The people that are in Social Security right now, we're not even going to touch. You're, everything stays the same for you. The people that are going into Social Security pretty soon, not even going to touch it. Everything stays the same for you. But the younger generation, they should have the option to do things. But we get attacked. We get attacked for trying to solve a problem. They're letting it go broke, making it worse on a daily basis. And we're going to talk about that in this campaign. Because you're exactly right. You know, uh, our entitlement system's uh, uh, going bankrupt right now. People are depending on those things. They're not going to be there. Yes, sir. Could you 
you kind of you kind of go into a little bit more detail. You said we need to reform the tax code. Yeah, sure. And I didn't either. I, I I think I missed it. If you said something, but do you believe in the flat tax where everybody pays a little, or or, or, or a percentage, or what? Do you have any details that you form? Absolutely. Your, well, you know, a perfect example, you know, um, you know, my family, we have Arkin Lumber Company, for example, right? And we paid more taxes this year than General Electric. And they have like a $10 billion profit. Now, how does that make sense? Does that make any sense? The tax code is um, in deep trouble right now. And, and what I mean by that is you've got um, powerful interests. They may be very, very wealthy people. They may be very, very large businesses. But they have the ability to afford lobbyists that create loopholes that create all these different um, little tweaks to the tax code. Our tax code grows by hundreds of thousands of words every year. Okay? Well, those words are getting added for a reason. What we need to do, and I think what the Republican Party as a whole is standing on and has been standing on, is we need to simplify the tax code. You need to get rid of a lot of those loopholes. You need to streamline the tax code so that everybody is, uh, you know, is participating in the tax code. There's not loopholes out. In terms of, um, you know, there's the fair tax that's out there. There's the flat tax that's out there. The fair tax is a, um, it's, it's very, it's not complex, but it, it's a big process. But it's essentially a consumption-based tax code policy. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. You know, the flat tax is obviously, I don't care how much money you made this year, if you made uh, you know forty thousand dollars, you pay fifteen percent. If you pay if you made forty million dollars, you pay fifteen percent. Now we all know everybody's going to pay the same rate, but they're obviously going to pay a different amount of money. And there's a lot of merit to that as well. I personally think the first thing we need to do is shrink the tax code, clean up the tax code, make it more transparent, so that everybody that should be paying taxes or paying the tax, they don't have special interest loopholes. I want to get rid of those loopholes. Then I think we need to have a serious discussion. I think that it's very likely that at the end of the day, what we would end up having is something that takes, uh, we, it would probably be very, I'm just being blunt, it would probably be very hard to get a straight flat tax, but there is probably definitely a possibility of uh, decreasing the number of, of, of levels, maybe to two or three, and I think that